Good afternoon and welcome to the Art Museum of West Virginia University's Lunchtime Looks series. We're going to give everyone a minute to get signed in and into the Zoom and then we're going to get started with our talk here today. So um, I'm going to pause for just a moment as I watch the numbers tick up on the participants and uh, then we'll get going. So thank you all for joining us here today. Okay, and I think that's enough of an awkward pause. So we'll go ahead and um, start and as other people come in, then they can join into the conversation. So my name is Heather Harris and I am the Educational Programs Manager at the Art Museum of West Virginia University. And I am happy to be here today in our gallery that is featuring the exhibition, Personal to Political, the African-American, or celebrating the African-American artists of the Paulson Fontaine Press. So this exhibition is on display through the beginning of December. And I really hope that all of you are able to come and uh, see it here in person. Uh, but we are also really privileged. One of the happy things about um, doing everything remotely is that we are able to uh, bring in some conversations with artists who we otherwise might not bring, be able to bring to our facility. And that's what we're able to do here today with Radcliffe Bailey, who is our guest. He has four works of art that are featured in this exhibition, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about those and the process of making those, and then talk about some of his um, more current work as well. So uh, good afternoon. Welcome, Radcliffe. We're really happy <laughs> to have you here with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, and before we get started, just a couple technical things. First is we are going to take questions at the end of Radcliffe's talk, and you can put those in the Q&A uh, box. So we're gonna be using the Q&A function rather than the chat function. Um, and the other thing to note is that we do have a closed captioner, a live captioner here today. So if you would like to avail yourself of that service, you can just click the CC button at the bottom. All right, so without further ado, we'll get started. So as I said, I'm actually in our gallery for the moment that is featuring um, Radcliffe's work. And I'm in front of one of the prints that he made at Paulson Fontaine Press called Tobacco Blues. And I'm going to actually switch over and uh, share my screen so that you can see some high resolution images of um, some of the other works of art that he has on display in this exhibition. And so we see this one here. So one of the things that you might notice um, from the two that you've seen and uh, the other two that are in this exhibition is that they both feature photographs, uh, photographic images, uh, surrounded by the artistic um, <laughs> interpretation around them. So that was actually the first thing that I wanted to, because it's one of the first things I noticed when I um, saw Radcliffe's work. So it's one of the things I wanted to ask him about is where did these photographs come from and how did they factor into the inspiration for these works of art? Well, um, early on in my work, um, well, for one, my grandparents um, are from Virginia and my grandmother and grandfather lived in a town called Palmyra, which was right outside of Charlottesville. And I would spend summers with my grandparents, I mean, spend summers with my grandparents, go there on holidays. But the one thing that I remember, and I kind of tell this story often is that I remember when I was in art school and right before my um, grandparents passed, my grandmother gave me an album of photographs and there were some of these photographs which from their early 1900s. There were tintypes and they were just photographs. She didn't know a lot of the photographs, but some of the photographs in, in the album were family members. And I assumed that those were also like, a lot of them were family members or close to the family. Um, and I, so I started working with these images because of some of my, you know, as, as being a student, 
in school, I wanted to make work that was personal to me. And I was trying to figure out ways. And I, and the easiest way was to look towards my family and look towards my grandparents. Um, and so she gave me these photographs and I felt obligated to use those images. And I used the images that I knew, knew nothing about because I felt like a lot of those images that we go to antique shops and we see them at different places, they end up becoming discarded and no one knew much about those images. So that was kind of like a starting point. And a part of that starting point was based around also an interest in African art. I felt like when I would go to museums, I would see African art hanging on the wall. I didn't really know a lot about the African art and I felt like that it was an influence and I was part by the image. So I keep the um, 10 types in the photographs, just like the objects of the African art, I respond to them. And I respond to them in um, two different ways. One, uh, I come from a personal point of relationship to the photograph, but also in dealing with uh, different worlds and different images, uh, working in the realm of abstraction in a way and referencing quilts, and then also dealing with something that's tangible, which is a photograph. So that first piece was called Between Worlds, and this one is called In the Garden. And it was the reference between those different thoughts, but that's also the influence of music. Uh, while working on this piece was listening to John Coltrane's um, Green Sleeves. And, and you look at the piece itself, you'll see notes um, of music on this one in particular in the garden where you see uh, John Coltrane's notes, um, scores from some of his music. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. Uh, I've been working with um, um, Paulson, Fontaine Press since like 97, 97, 98. And then, you know, these are photographs that are back when I first started working with them. And because I worked, uh, my paintings themselves are in layers. And I worked in maybe like seven, seven different layers and some of the layers of thoughts and some of them are actual materials. And you can kind of see where I'm branding some of the work. And then I'm also using like, uh, you know, like tobacco leaves and the tobacco leaves and the piece that was uh, tobacco blues was actually a photograph that my grandfather took in Virginia where um, it's a reference to, uh, to my grandfather um, as well. So, and, and, you know, working in the press and working with many different layers and different plates uh, enabled me to work the same way in which I work um, in the studio. I didn't study printmaking. It was, um, I was invited to make prints and um, it was like a perfect medium for me to work with it. Uh, you go to the next slide. And you can kind of see I, my attitude is I like to work on maybe 15 different things at one time. So it's kind of like the same attitude when I'm making prints. Um, is to make as much as I can and um, create um, problems to solve. And you go on to the next slide. Um, this piece is called Pullman and it's based around um, my father being a railroad engineer, but also the blues and playing with the words. Uh, it's a heart and playing with the idea of um, Pullman and pulmonary. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, this this piece is called Return No, and this is kind of more like um, my paintings where I speak about the layers. It's plexiglass. Uh, these are almost like big cabinets, and the cabinets themselves are based around medicine cabinets. The idea is like whenever you're sick, you go to the medicine cabinet to get something to make you feel better. For me, it was to go towards memory, and it's also a reference uh, to like um, Congolese um, sculpture. Um, where you can actually see images. But um, this is a sculpture that was a public sculpture that's done in Atlanta. It's in a Auburn Avenue Research Center and it was commissioned to me by the county. And it was about uh, libraries and um, shelves and books on shelves and um, how libraries are some kind, sometimes not as inviting, just like sometimes museums are not necessarily as inviting. So the idea was to do this piece on the outside, which is referencing bookshelves and thoughts. I have like objects, you can go to the next slide. Um, I have objects on the shelves, it's all made in steel, but objects on the shelves where you have a ladder that turns into a DNA strand to references to family history and music and um, connecting it to the community in which I live. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, and before I pop on, I actually had a question from, from one of our participants was asking about um, the images of sailboats and I was trying to see where, where he had seen Oh, uh, the images are, which I think it was on that painting, but there's also a boat on this piece, uh, on this one, but then also the next one with the sculpture, there's an image of uh, a steamship and it, um, 
it was um, a lot of it was based on um, references to my family members that were Garveyites and Marcus Garvey had a fleet of ships to go back to Africa. And so it's a reference to that and also just travel and journey and movement. Um, I'm often doing stuff based around the sea and based around land. Um, so that's where it's um, sailboats they're really about voices space for me. You good. And this is one of the ship and um, uh, pivots and you can ship moves in different directions. It's usually set up where the ship points towards the east. And um, there's a tarp behind, and the tarp has like lines, the Mason Dixon line sewed on the inside of it, but also constellation of stars in outer space. Um, inside the baskets are glass, and a lot of that's just references to sand and beaches and glass. You go, next slide. This piece is based around the Congo. Um, the Congo, and uh, it was a trip that I took to Belgium, and it was referencing to um, the rubber, rubber in the Congo and uh, Africans that were um, doing the rubber. And also uh, Leopold tried to make um, statements to them that when they didn't necessarily get as much rubber as the, he, they would like, they would cut off the arms of different, uh, the arms of people. And so I took these religious arms and objects and um, put it on, top, on the top of a tarp, which is that the tarp itself is actually rubber. So you can go to the next slide. You go to the next. This was this piece is called Echo. Echo is based around the Great Mosque in Mali, um, and so basically, there's a certain time of year every time they would uh, work on the mosque and um, create and uh, work over the top of it with the um, clay and the earth. And so, what I did because I live in Georgia and there's so much red clay around, so I, I created like a piece where there's uh, Georgia clay dripping into a shell, and it's called Echo. Um, this is called, uh, I can't remember exactly the title, you have to excuse me, but this is a, a painting that I did based on those same kind of journeys about the idea of the African art um, traveling in this mysterious ways to this continent and having influences on us, but then also those that were lost at sea and the, and the, um, the different regions and places within West Africa where a lot of African Americans and people around the, um, around the world come from, and so I'm really dealing with those people on a boat. And it's almost like the there's a storm, but there's also like a calm about it. It's almost like it's at night, but it's sometimes it's kind of part of during the day, so it's like a strange time. So, yes, this piece is called Nest. And Nest, I'm working with taxidermy, and these are piano keys that are um, a part of my work that's kind of come in and out. And Ness is, um, I'm using a, a falcon and it's a reference to Egyptian. And it's also, there's a reference to um, um, basketball teams, Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> I mean, Atlanta Hawks, I'm sorry. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot of reference. This one is based on, um, the next one is on um, W.B. Du Bois and, um, and I made a piece where I'm, I'm dealing with W.B. Du Bois had this, um, thought about uh, a double consciousness and he's um, in Amherst and this, I wanted to make something, you can go to the next slide, but I wanted to make a piece about W.E.B. Du Bois, but um, he's such a serious, I wanted to add a sense of humor about it and I used Rodin's The Thinker in reference to W. Du Bois and it's bronze, but you can go to the next piece. And this piece is called On Your Way Up. And this is um, another one that's dealing with taxidermy um, using crocodiles. And it was, this was a crocodile from a Dia session from a museum in Belgium. And, and basically, you know, a lot of that stuff was taken from the Congo. So I, um, on this tarp itself, it was based around my, grand, my grandfathers and um, when they passed. So on the top of the tarp, you have stitching of dates and, and um, times in which they pass. You can go to the next slide. This one's called Levitate. Um, this was a boat that 
and I made it so that the, the blood itself levitates the guitar. The body work is around the tarps, and part of using the tarps is the ideal is that that was used for shipping, and so the ideal shipping movement, um, and I'm trying to put a lot of meaning behind the materials that speak for themselves as well. This one's called um, this kind of goes back to when we're talking about the photographs that were given to me by my um, by my grandmother I'm in a family album just like that one and I, I took that same family I did it in uh, jewelry clay and I used a falcon on on top of it as well but then so when I was in Virginia at the time as a kid I remember 14 years seven locusts where all the cicadas came out and I just remember seeing all this and so there's a jack top and the cicadas um, the shells of the cicadas are inside the shell and then also as uh, one of my favorite jazz musicians which is Sun Ra and he talked about outer space and him being from Saturn but he actually was from Alabama so you can go to the next slide um, this piece is called rocking rocking was based on dance um, and it's also dance, but it's a map, and it's a map, and it deals with the, um, the moon and travel and different places in the world as well. But it's also a rock that was pulled out of the backyard, and I use, you can go to the next slide, it gives you a different angle. And so you kind of get a sense, it's some similar imagery, but um, I often work in, um, you know, my earlier paintings were very bright and colorful. Uh, but I often, um, at moments, I paint the opposite way. Whenever, whenever things feel good, I go to sometimes darker colors. Thank you. And then um, this piece was done um, in New Orleans. This was a music stand that's about, it's about, I want to say about, the piece itself is about 12 feet tall. The instruments are taken from, from New Orleans, and it was like, um, right after Katrina, right around uh, the Ninth Ward. And there was a school there in Ninth Ward and it was uh, one of the schools that the uh, Marcellus uh, formed. And, and so I had those damaged instruments um, from, from Katrina and I used those in the piece. And go to the next slide. And you go to the next. This piece is called Tricky. And Tricky is more so a self-portrait and is based around an African deity, um, based around one named Eshu, Eshu Alegba by way of Nigeria. And the top hat represents that, um, him as a trickster and someone who sits at the crossroads. And there's also a collar, a metal collar that goes around a rock. And that collar was dealing with, uh, during, um, during slavery, those that were very, um, that escaped. Um, and there was a way in which they made these collars so that they could keep track of them. And so it's also a reference to that too. And the colors themselves are red and black are a reference to issue as well. You can go to the next one. Uh, this is my studio. I'm working on a piece. This was a piece I did this uh, past year and a half. I think it's maybe two years. I did it for it's commissioned by the Atlanta Falcons football team. And I did it based on the proximity of the stadium to the historically um, black colleges uh, in Atlanta. And those photographs themselves they are using the pieces are HBCUs from the early, like 19, 19, I think I have one from 1901 to 1922 and it's Lincoln University. And then there's also, uh, I think it's Hampton and Atlanta University. And you can keep, next slide. There you go, next. And this is the piece installed. And this piece is called Caravan. It's called Caravan. It's a big cabinet. It's like the medicine cabinets, like I talk, talked about earlier. It's a combination of all those different kind of objects. And was, this is me more so responding to the photograph. Um, there's a boat that's in the bottom of it, and the boat was made from matchsticks, and it was from uh, from prisons. Um, a lot of the inmates would make uh, art out of different objects, and so that one was made out of matchsticks. And go to the next. And 
And this was this piece was based around Charleston. This was based around the people who died in the church in Charleston that were killed in the church. And so you have railroad tracks that are uh, going across the piece, and uh, you have a palm that goes in and was dealing with the symbols of the state flag of um, South Carolina. But the the railroad tracks are like a blood red, and it was a piece in reaction to those very difficult times. And I'm sorry, you hear my dog in the background. <laughs> but the piece that you just went past, um, the one with the, the white tarp, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. The piece with the white uh, tarp was, uh, was a piece that was, uh, it's a big shipping tarp and it was made in response to my family members that were part of the Underground Railroad and they ended up migrating from the South and ended up in New Jersey where I was born. And so what you have is like a neon in at the top, which is dealing with the North Star and the travels by tracks. You can go to the next slide. This piece is called Vessel and this was done for Prospect uh, a couple years back. And the piece that itself has sound that runs through it and it has uh, the sound that was composed. I worked with a, uh, a musician here in Atlanta uh, who played the cello's name is, um, um, he, uh, it'll come to me in a minute, but we, I created, um, the, helped him create a piece that was based on people traveling by night. So on a full moon, I burnt a fire in my backyard and I recorded sound of fire popping and him playing the cello and respond to those that were escaping to slavery. But it was about when you go into peace, you look up and you look up and then you can see the sky, but the sound comes out the conch shell that's on the inside of it. You go to the next slide. And you go to the next. And so this piece too is kind of the same idea about the sound, but this is part of a bigger piece. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so this piece is called Windward Coast and it is made out of maybe over 400 sets of piano keys and the piano keys are turning into waves. And you go to the next slide. And so the piano keys are turning in waves and then there's a figure that kind of comes throughout the, uh, throughout the waves. And it was based on those lost at sea, uh, based on the different storms, be it Katrina, be it like different tsunamis. And it's, I just remember seeing images of those incidents and I was responding to that, but I'm um, all a child of fishing with my father. And you can go to the next slide. And the chef is in that corner and has the sound coming throughout the show um, of piano keys dropping. And uh, you go to the next slide. And this piece is called Nomo. Nomo was done um, this past year. I did it for this time now, and um, it was migration. The sound incorporated with this, which is the sound of Sun Ra, and it's a radio on the back with an antenna that's made out of a pyramid. All right. And this is called The Door No Return, um, which was done. I did it based on a trip that I took to Senegal after learning my DNA on my mother's side, and I recreated The Door No Return, but also. Um, the outer part of it is made out of black sand and glitter and basically it's meant to look like as if you were in outer space as well. Okay, and I think that's the last slide. All right, so I was dubious that Radcliffe would get through all of those images and, and he just <laughs> flew right through them. But I think that that means that people probably have a lot of questions about what they saw and about process. We paused for that one question about uh, the ships, but we actually have another question about something that you referenced earlier as well. Um, one of the um, retired music faculty actually at our university wanted you to go back to um, John Coltrane and his influence on your, mu on your art and maybe music more generally because we saw in a lot of those pieces, um, that influence. But if you could maybe talk about John Coltrane in particular, and then um, uh, maybe music more broadly. Well, um, John Coltrane was introduced to me by one of my college professors. And 
um, also going through, be it through my um, college professor, but also um, um, albums that were that I collected from my uncle um, to, it was, it, there was also like this thing um, when I think about his music or, or think about jazz in general, um, music was like, for me, was like my first form of under, since we didn't, at the time when I was listening to music, but I didn't, DNA wasn't out and you couldn't trace yourself back to a certain place. So music that was always become like a part and responded to different sounds and rhythm. And I think it was more so like the spirituality of uh, John Coltrane. Um, be it like at the same time it can be spiritual but in political at the same time um, in particular like the music that um, the piece that he did based on the four girls that died in the church bombing and by listening to his music I always wanted to create a visual form of um, the music itself because I still I mean I don't I look at musicians and visual artists and um, dancers, uh, I look at them all in the same way, and uh, but, um, but in general, when I think about Coltrane, I think about Coltrane, I think about Ross on Roland Kirk, um, I think about Albert Eiler, I think about a lot of music that I, uh, it's almost like, it's a strange reference, but like going to an antique shop and being able to go and to go through time, music in general for me is a way in which I could learn about certain things of a certain time period that I didn't know much about, or be it that music was made around the same time I was born as well. Great, thank you. So um, we also had a question about all of the different materials that you use. So they um, uh, we're curious if you made your ship from toothpicks, and I was trying to go back to see which which, <laughs> which ship she was uh, referring to. There was some. There was a. There. Were, I collect a lot of objects. Um, antique shops, like I was saying, that's like one of my favorite places to go shopping for materials. Um, but in terms of materials, I'm often looking for materials that have a past and they have a meaning and I can incorporate and add another meaning. Um, I spoke about this the other day to someone I was, you know, I was real fascinated with, uh, as I mentioned too, was fascinated with African art, but there's a way in which today African art is kind of, you know, we see the objects in the museum, but today they may transfer to different types of contemporary materials. And so I'm fascinated with trying to do the same thing and have the same kind of um, power within it, or I'm trying to have that power. So I'm not really sure if I catch it or I get it, but that's my goal. So I have sense that kind of quality of something that you walk up to, but you walk around and be very cautious of. So. I don't know if I answered that question, but I tried. Great, and I think as an extension of that, thinking about how many materials you use, um, someone wanted to know if you had people who helped you in the assembly, especially of some of these larger works, like the ones at the end. Um, I do, I do. Um, all right, that last piece at the end was um, created in Istanbul, and I worked with some assistants there, and it was really about the materials and at the moment, and um, and thinking it out and. Um, but I do have people that work with me, but I often, I'm kind of, I don't know if I'm gonna call myself old school in the, in the sense of, I do like working by myself, but I also, I enjoy um, working with others as well. So there is a part where there, you know, I have some structures fabricated for me. Um, I build some sometimes. I'm Right now I'm currently doing a lot of welding and um, making things in steel because I have a sculpture background. And so I'm, I'm kind of, I, I do, I, I, I use people when needed um, and I, I enjoy it often because it is somewhat of a collaboration. But yes, I have two assistants to help me every once in a while. Great, thank you. And someone wanted us to go back to the discussion of NOMO because you, um, you were breaking, your sound broke up a little bit there for a second. 
And you're frozen. You're frozen a little bit again now. Sorry. Okay. You talk about it. Yeah, I think just um, kind of revisit some of what you said because we couldn't hear you so well. I, basically, I was trying to create a vessel where one could travel throughout time. And, it, you know, there was a reference to Sun Ra and uh, the reference to Sun Ra was, you know, this idea of this kind of spaceship and orchestra. And so it's meant to be like an arc in a way. And the figures themselves, that mask, that, that, that sculpture, that bust, that bust was taken from a death mask. Um, and it was from um, a Belgian um, antique dealer. And basically, if it was a Belgian antique dealer, those people were from the Congo. So it's really about, um, about that image, that guy. Sometimes I use that um, sculpture um, to represent um, a certain part of my work. Um, so it kind of, he comes up every once in a while through uh, different pieces. Great, thanks for revisiting that. Um, does anyone else, we have, does anyone else have any other questions in the Q&A? Or I can offer a couple, but I'll, I'll give people a chance to type. And um, sort of as I'm doing that, kind of thinking, um, going back to these prints that we have on display here, Okay. And I was interested, you know, you talked about how you really tried to, with the, um, with the press, try and get that sense of layering and maybe um, dimensionality in the 2D of the prints. And I was wondering how you, if you could talk a little bit more about that process, like how do you convey layers that seem to be so important to your work when you know that the output is going to be um, a two-dimensional print? Right. But I also question whether or not it is two dimensional as well. But fair uh, enough. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that, you know, I would love for Pam, um, Pam Paulson to actually have a conversation with me about that, too. But um, I, you know, I my earlier work, I, I used a lot of layers. And so they felt that there was a there was a good way of working in the press with layers because layers. And it was like, you know, that perfect moment more times there's a way I can incorporate different materials. And then often top of some of those layers. Uh, some of them aren't necessarily seen, but there's also like it's like a game of chess. Um and I'm playing this game of chess with myself, and um, I learn from my mistakes. And I'm not really making them, uh, not really making mistakes. It's more like that's just a part of the rhythm of the work itself, and it's really about the moment. Um, but it, it was, um, I really like making prints. Um, I like the way in which the plates come in, and you know, I'm able to etch and draw over top and incorporate different materials like some of those that we were doing you know like incorporating like tobacco leaves or working with indigo or or burning burning things while going through the press um and just it you know it's it, it's a beautiful way of working i mean it's an old thing i think you know the press itself is a that's like a very revolutionary act of being able to print and, and you know, just the press in general, but yeah. Great, thank you. And for those of you who were lucky enough to attend our last lunchtime looks, that actually was Pam Paulson was our speaker and she was able to kind of talk a little bit about that process of, um, you know, and I, I take your point that there really is dimensionality to, to these pieces and especially in the way they kind of build up the layers within them. So um, that's one of the real um, skillful things that is done at, the, at, these, at these presses. So thank you for that answer. So now we've had a few more things go, come through the Q&A. So I have someone asks, do you have any thoughts on the use of abstraction in art that features African-Americans? Well, I mean, it's a abstraction, abstraction, abstraction. I don't know. Jazz is abstraction. Um, uh, I think that the way in which we deal and operate in the world, it's very abstract. It's very new. Um, sometimes because we're like, 
when I think about it, our makeups are so our makeups are so interesting, but we're a mix of a lot of different types of people. And and trying to digest that and trying to articulate it, that's one thing. That's to me where abstraction comes out. Um, and you know, I've, uh, uh, someone the artist told me and we talked about, well, you know, surreal is real to black people. And, uh, some of these things, you know, the thought about it conceptually, like we deal with this and we have to put out this music and we put out this visual art and, you know, the blues are real, you know, we can, you can talk about the blues and, you know, the blues are just a way of just getting through these times. And I think about um, um, the work itself in terms of African-American artists and abstraction. Um, sometimes we deal with things and, um, where we're, you know, we're dealing with like figurative work. And I think that's important, but there's a, also a part of it where we can talk about things that we cannot necessarily articulate. And I think that's a perfect place and for abstraction. Great, thank you. That's a, a really uh, co complex answer to a complex question. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and continuing to live in that world of complexity, Carolyn would like to know that uh, more more about your statement that you create problems to solve. So can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by that and how you, how you do that? Well, I think it's easy to make a, a pretty, uh, a beautiful painting, but I don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's easy to come up with a formula to create something that's beautiful. But for myself, and I know many, many others, it's it's really about that conversation with the work. It's about more like um, I'm gonna create a problem to solve because I want to solve problems. It's just like math. I mean, you know, it's it's a certain kind of way in which you you want to solve a problem. I want to solve in the world. I'm, I'm really about how I can solve my. Uh, I don't. Uh, Cliff, you're breaking up a little bit on the audio again, so. Okay. Oh. No. Uh, can you go. hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so I would, uh, I would put uh, colors so work together. Those colors. Um, that's problem. Uh, materials that don't work well together. Um, you know, I work with materials like found materials, and I want to. Um, create some type of, um, I don't know, it's hard. It's hard, it's like, like a musician trying to create a certain rhythm or a certain sound, it's, it's similar. Thank you, and I'm actually going to, um, this is the disadvantage of being in the digital sphere, both we're having a little bit of feedback issue, um, okay. but also we can't kind of follow up in the same way, so I'm noticing that uh, Ray, who asked the initial question about abstraction and African American art, uh, actually um, had a follow up a few a few lines down. So okay. I'm gonna try and delve back into that. Like I said, this is where you you miss the flow of being in person. But he okay. said he wanted to clarify and say that um, he's asking about mm -hmm. the distinction between figurative works of black bodies versus working in a more abstract way, like uh, how you um, think about that distinction. Okay, well, I feel like I deal, I mean, I often, I mean, I feel like I'm dealing with black bodies or dealing with the black body itself, um, because I'm dealing with my own personal scale, I'm dealing with, um, uh, I, I, yeah, it's a, it's a, I understand, I understand the question, I'm just trying to figure out a way, of, I don't think I've really answered the question before. I thought about the question, um, but there's a there's a way to deal with a different part of the black body. I'm very much influenced by the work of August um, uh, storytelling. Uh, I'm interested in you know, as an African American artist and uh, my with a museum or a place that maybe at one moment I was not necessarily 
there weren't that many black bodies existing in those spaces. So the work itself to me, I feel like I have to bring out something that's very personal to me. Um, and I, I, I bring out that personal stuff because I really feel like we've never really been in terms of thoughts within this world in general. I feel like our body been allowed to be in within those spaces, but our stories and our and I am I'm interested in my story, stories of uh, those that I know and uh, my family members um, or different ancestors. I feel like things come through me like a vessel and I allow them to come out. Uh, and I, I apologize, we're still getting a little bit of feedback and free and freezing from you, Radcliffe. And again, we're, we're talking about such important and, and dense, complex questions. It's, it's really hard in this format um, when the tech isn't coming up. But Ray, I hope you were able to get at least um, part of, of, of uh, Radcliffe's answer to your, your question. And it's definitely something that I think is worth considering further. Um, but maybe um, we'll try a couple more questions and see if, see if, uh, if the connection holds. Um, hopefully we can okay. ask a couple more things. Um, uh, George is um, really thinking about the context that we're in here at a university. Um, he uh, was wondering um, if you, um, sorry, <laughs> I lost my place because I was thinking about the tech distance difficulties. He, he says that you mentioned you studied art and WVU teaches art. Um, what specifically prepared you for where you are creatively now? So I think, especially because we are an institution that, you know, has a primary primary focus on serving students, thinking about um, what in your education or, or um, preparation really set you up to be where you are now? Mm. <laughs> well, uh, I'll just speak from from my hunger as a, as a young student going to art school. Um, I was always fascinated, um, number one, the library. Um, as a student going into an art school library, there were very, 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 very few images of African-American artists. Um, there was really like a handful of artists that were really actually being talked about. And, you know, it was so old to the point where half the books didn't really, the images weren't in color. So I didn't really have a sense of their work, but I got a sense of who they were as time went on. I think that um, growing up in a city like Atlanta, um, for me, was real important because um, I had access to uh, historically black colleges, uh, a city where there was a lot of African-American artists. There were annuals that used to happen here in Atlanta at Atlanta University where artists like uh, Romé Bearden, Elizabeth Catlett, uh, Jacob Lawrence, they would submit work because they weren't, some of them were not necessarily having like a lot of stuff in a lot of other major places. And even though some of them were beginning to be known for what they did, they were committed to um, showing their work within the Atlanta University system. And those annuals turned into annuals that ended up going into like, there was a organis there was an insurance company called Atlanta Life Insurance Company. And they used to have these annuals where African-American artists would submit their work. And that spilled over from the, um, from the ones that would happen at the, um, Atlanta University. So, um, that was pretty important. And then throughout this city, I grew up um, here where we had a thing called the National Black Arts Festival where we had poets, writers, actors, visual artists um, from all around the country. Um, and, and actually outside the country, those were important kind of moments in my life. And then I, as I learned through my friends about um, situations that happened in West Africa where like FESTAC and I think in 1967 where African-American art, Af artists of, of um, African descent from all around the world showed up in um, Nigeria for a festival. 
and knowing about those situations, it, it was very important, but I always felt like there were um, two different worlds. And I was, you know, I was lucky as a kid um, to, for one, my mom would take me to museums. Um, and I just remember um, one show in particular, well, two shows, one of uh, a show of Jacob Lawrence that came to the High Museum. I was in middle school. And I remember as a kid, just um, my mom taking me and, and I was waiting in line and being introduced to him. And that, that was a very profound, you know, it was a, it was a big influence. And then before I had to meet uh, James Vanity, um, which was at a show. Uh, this was like right, right before he passed. Um, it, in a community where I could kind of get somewhat of a sense of those kind of things, it actually made it easier for me when I went to art school and I'm searching for images and I'm looking for people, look for African-American artists and I'm searching, I'm searching them. And I'm looking at artists from all around the world, but it was very difficult to find images about us and um, things about us. You know, it was like sometimes it would just be the same artists over and over and over and over. Um, of people who I, who I consider heroes, but it was also very, you know, hard to find yourself um, within that. But I always knew that there were artists out there making work, but they were just not being celebrated. Thank you. And I think that that's really um, an important note about, like I said, we're a university museum, so we're, we're kind of invested in university education, um, obviously as a value, but I think you really highlight and point out both how that can be, um, uh, leave a lot of people out and leave a lot of information out and also how some of your experiences um, really build and get you there in maybe more profound ways even than university training. So it's all, it all adds on each other and I really appreciate the, um, the complexity of that answer. Um, and speaking of inspiration, and you, you maybe touched on that, you talked about artists that inspired you, and we talked about music a little more. Um, Cindy wanted to know um, if there were even other arts that inspired your artwork, like perhaps literature or poetry or anything like that. Um, yeah, I think, um, wow, there are a lot. Um, no, and R. Wilson, um, you're a filmmaker from um, um, there were there's I mean it's endless amounts of um influences. I think they for me, I mean I'm I'm often influenced by music a lot. There are visual artists that influence me. Um, but, you know, a lot of those older artists, um, you know, the current things, I like current, you know, I like everything. I'm, I'm very open. Um, I feel like, you know, in the, in the world we live in today, you know, we didn't have the internet. You couldn't just Google and look for, um, look on, you know, for a subject and find an artist and understand who's doing this across the world. Um, we didn't have that. And, um, you know, we wouldn't be doing Zoom talks right now. We would, I would be clicking slides on a slide, <laughs> a slide reel. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's, there are a lot, um, you know, Octavia Butler. I mean, you know, there are, yeah, there are a lot. I mean, you know, I've always been influenced by the self-taught as well. Um, there's a, you know, there's a blacksmith that was in Charleston named Philip Simmons, and he would make these metal gates. Um, you know, um, I look at a lot right now, Thomas Day's work, who was making um, furniture um, around the time of the Civil War. You know, I'm, you know, it's a combination. There's all kinds of stuff um, that I look at, um, you know, quilt makers, you know, just textiles in general. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, 
even though, as we talked about, the prints in, in our current exhibition are about 20 years old and you've been working for Paulson Fontaine for, for a while yeah. now, and a lot of your slideshow kind of updated us and brought us up to date on their process, Chris actually would like to be even more up to the minute update, updated and like to know what you're <laughs> working on at present um, as opposed to in the past couple of years. So maybe I think he's maybe looking at your studio behind you and things and, and oh. wondering. What, what's going through your mind right now? <laughs> um, well, right now I'm doing, I'm working on um, two public sculptures um, and I'm creating these sculptures in cast concrete and they're outdoor public pieces and they're, one of them is an amphitheater. And uh, another is a sculpture that's going, one's going up in Atlanta as the amphitheater, which is a, one that's based around uh, music and based around uh, young musicians that are um, in Atlanta that play instruments and trying to find, create a space for them to perform. And so I'm creating open air spaces out of cast concrete, but then also a piece that's in Greensboro is done um, based around the sit-ins that happen in Greensboro, but it's not specifically straightforward dealing with that, but it's also, it's a reference to uh, travel because of, as a kid, um, we would always go visit family members up north. We would start start from Atlanta in the middle of the night and catch that midnight train coming from Georgia, and we would go straight up through the Carolinas and stop and see family members and DC, Virginia, and then we would end up towards Philadelphia. And so the piece is set on that migration, but also back to a reference from the migration from the South to the North as a part of the Underground Railroad. So um, those are things. I'm doing just as much as I'm doing studio, but I'm all return back to making sculpture because I was a sculpture major in college. So I'm doing a lot of fabricating, welding and making forms. Great, thank you. So I think that that rounds out our Q&A um, uh, from our participants, from our audience. Um, if anyone wants to jump in with a final last minute question, um, we'll go ahead and let them. Oh reappear here. I'm now out of the gallery because we are open to mm -hmm. the public and I was trying to minimize ambient noise. So I've, I've moved out of the gallery, um, but would definitely, as I said, encourage all of you to come down here and see Radcliffe's work and the many others that are, are featured here. Um, and uh, like I said, I think that there is um, a great connection between all of this work that he was showing us that you know when I when I called him to do this program he said I'm not a printmaker <laughs> but we see <laughs> all of the layers and I actually see Pam Paulson jumping into the chat saying that prints are comprised <laughs> of layers so she's she's calling me out on my question about dimensionality as Radcliffe did <laughs> so like I said both Pam last month, Radcliffe this month, and I'll put a plug in our next month's speaker is Lava Thomas, who's also featured in this exhibition. Um, nice. And um, I know Radcliffe had a conversation with her at another museum program. And it really is, um, like I said, there are very few things that feel better about being in this pandemic. But one of them is that we can have these conversations with people in Atlanta and California and um, that we might not otherwise be able to. So we're really grateful to you for your time and your creativity and being able to have some of your works of art on display here, Radcliffe. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you. Please um, visit our events page, sign in and register for the Talk with Lava because I'm sure that it will be equally stimulating and interesting.